You won't start? You are happy with starting the next talk? Up to the audience, I guess. <laughs> yes, the audience say yes. Say yes. 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 <laughs> that was super loud. <laughs> Louder? Yes. <laughs> yes, you do it. Right. My friend Manuel talks about traffic. Super hard the, to see, the, right? Yeah, the, the nicest logo on the planet. <laughs> it's Gopher. Goldie. 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 Golden what, Gopher. Whatever, whatever you pronounce it. Mario um, talks about routing your microservice architecture to easy DevOps enterprise transformation. It's a very long title. Yeah, and super buzzword things, but yeah. Oh, am I exciting? It's your turn. <laughs> you got to go with the time. Through the room. <laughs> All right. <laughs> bye bye. Take care. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, just a quick introduction about me. I'm Emmanuel. I'm uh, the head of product open source at Contagious, which is the company behind Traffic. Who could have guessed that? Uh, I'm also a long-term maintainer on Traffic. I was, I was one of the first maintainers that joined the open source project uh, roughly three and a half years ago. So finally joining the company was like the next logical step because like, I mean, I was putting all my free time into it, so why not getting paid for it? Um, you can also find me on Twitter and GitHub, and I like feedback for like any sort. So whatever you have, just just hit me and uh, and we can talk. The quick part about contain about Contagious, uh, we believe in open source. That's where we started. We started with traffic, and we will we will keep on doing. Uh, we deliver traffic. We deliver the enterprise edition of traffic, and of course Mesh or or a simpler service Mesh. Um, approach. We also offer commercial support. Currently, we are around 30 people distributed acro across across the world. We currently have people working from eight different countries. So we hire wherever the people are. Uh, the cool thing about this is that basically 90% of our employees uh, have a tech background. I guess the only ones that not having a tech background is the finance part and the back office part. Everyone else is tech. So that makes working uh, we're working quite cool and quite easy. Before we actually start about talking, um, why, do I, why do I actually want to route to my microservice architecture? Let's have a look first like, to how do we actually got there. Um, around the 1990s, uh, what, what, what was the main pattern available for software development was what we call the spaghetti-oriented architecture, or better known as copy and paste. I mean, whoever of you is still still working in maybe banks or insurance companies or whatever with their with their big or yeah even insurance companies with their big monolithic applications or even maybe maybe still written in COBOL or whatever where where your pain comes from um, you you know what it is around the 2000s. Um, what we discovered was what we call the lasagna oriented architecture, or better known as the layered monolith. Um, the best example for that is also again in banking and, um, or basically in the financial sector. Um, big, big fat Java written monolithic applications with layers of layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. And layers. So that's quite a pain. Finally, they figured around the 2010s that what they did might have not been uh, the best approach. So what we came through is what we call the ravioli-oriented architecture, or what we just for these days call microservices. Um, but what is actually about microservices? Well, the, the, the promise of microservices is quite nice. You have your small deployment units. They are easy to maintain, super, super fast to get in production. They just like work together nicely. There's there are no problems at all. Every every connection just works out great, far from the beginning. Um, however, in reality, things usually look a bit different. It's like they are just fighting to each other. Things just keeps crashing. Nobody has a fucking clue about what's going on. So. When you enter that stage, the next thing you need to answer yourself is, OK, things are crashing, things are down, whatever. But wh what part is actually down? Like, wh where is my service really like running, especially if you have Kubernetes clusters or so? Like, what the heck is just going on? As this is a common problem, and that has been figured with the transition to microservices quite early, there have been a couple of, a couple of tools 
that uh, that you usually pick, and it can be one, multiple, it can be the whole line, just take whatever you want. Um, it's all different, different, um, different tackles to solve that to solve that problem, but most of them are or traditional solutions, let's say, ended up to be a mess as well, because then you end up like this, <laughs> writing super long configuration files, um, maybe even in YAML if things go really, really worth. So that, that might have not been the best, the best around as well. And that's actually where we, uh, where, where we come in, or where we actually come to the, to the topic, because like, that's not a good solution, and I guess we can all see that, because just maintaining this file will, will be a mess in your microservice architecture. So the next logical step is to write less of that mess, because it will make, you, it will make you, uh, your maintenance life a bit easier. And that's where, in regards to, um, to routing, we, we come into play, like where traffic comes into play. Traffic is a reverse proxy slash load balancer slash edge proxy slash call it whatever your buzzword you want to throw at it because like it's such a messy space. But the thing that is not so messy is it's basically your thing in the middle, right? It takes requests from the internet and somehow routes them uh, inside your infrastructure into your infrastructure. That's relatively easy to explain. It comes with a couple features like automatic service discovery, which is the good thing where we don't need uh, configuration files anymore, but let's see about this. First, a couple facts about the traffic project. As of now, the traffic project itself, as said, roughly started four years ago. Currently has more than 27,000 uh, 27, stars on GitHub. More than 450 different people already touched the code. Um, on Docker Hub, we have more than 1.4 billion, billion downloads. And if I remember the last mail correctly, that number is probably not going to increase anymore because their internal counters on the Docker Hub just hit a border. So they won't give us any new numbers. Um, we are also in the top 15 on Golang projects like on GitHub. And we know that we have more than 100,000 living instances. So this, this thing is battle-proofed. Like, it's been used for a while. Um, lately, as of September last year, September, September last year, we we reworked traffic version one because um, we figured that we had lots of different feature requests from our community within that four years, and um, most of them, like if we want to like build the features that our community wants, we are in technical debt because when we started traffic v1. It was used to operate on level 7 only, so HTTP, HTTPS, and all the other protocols. Uh, and literally, I guess it was <laughs> issue number 16 or so, was please add TCP support. That was not going to work from the base we had, so we rewrote basically everything and started with Traffic V2. So what has changed is uh, we clarified the concepts, and I will tell you them in a, in a, in a bit. We have a new routing system. Uh, we have now better middlewares. We can do canary and mirroring and all that fancy stuff. And finally, DCP support, but also a bit more, and not just a bit, but we will see about this. About the core concepts, these have, these have changed a bit for better, for better flexibility. As said, traffic is an edge router. So it's in the middle, it takes requests, it forwards requests, that, that's, that's it. And the cool thing is, as I said, it it's dynamically discovers services running on your orchestrator. Mostly these days is it Kubernetes. Not saying that everyone that uses Kubernetes really needs Kubernetes, but that's probably a story for another talk. Um, but however, it, it connects to your orchestrator receives the information it wants from there and dynamically discovers uh, its routing based on the information it received. So no more YAML. The inner architecture, or how this actually works, is separated in three different, in three different stars. We have an incoming request that hits an entry point. From there it goes to routers and from there to services. But what is actually an entry point? Well, the entry point is still kind of the same as in traffic v1. It basically describes what am I listening on, like which port am I binding, for example. So it takes the requests given on the, on the port, and then you can set some, some global configuration, like you want to forward host headers, for example, and then that's it. So the entry point is not really fancy. 
what comes next is routers. The routers is where the fun gets, gets to start. Um, routers define what does the request look like. Like in the example, do I have a request that comes with a host of app.domain? Or do I have a request that comes with the host, uh, with the host domain? Um, and has a pass slash DB, for example. So that's a more, more let's say, API gateway-like um, found example. But what is cool is that you can add middlewares at a router level. So this router has a middleware attached auth users, for example. So that in this example could be that if you look for this specific route, you will have a basic authentication pop up just rising, and you have to put in your credentials, and, and you're done. And you can define that like all dynamically just by the information we receive from your, from your Kubernetes. And there are more middlewares, like circuit breakers, rate limiting, whatever. And once it passed that router, we will, we will come to the service. I actually have a more example for this. Because the cool thing at middleware is, is you can chain them. Like, let's say you need first need to have the authentication middleware, because you need to authenticate your users. And then you might, have, um, you might want to strip the path, like the slash DB, because maybe your service uh, running in the back like, does not know about that path. List. So you can all chain that together and like temper or edit the request in whatever fashion you want. From there, it comes to the services. And the services is basically our abstraction layer, let's say, around your containers. On that, on that level, you define um, uh, stickiness, cookie stickiness. You define the load balancer method, for example, for canary or mirroring, and all, all that sort of thing. Like, how do you want to, how do you want to um, connect from traffic to, to your backend containers? That configuration basically is done there. Once you configured all of these uh, three stages, we can give just a glance. So you have the entry point. It defines of what am I listening to. And then it goes to the routers, which is what does the request look like, and then what um, what certain ways I need to tweak the request or the response. And then it goes to the servers, like what is my load balancing algorithm, where are the containers located, and then it goes to the actual container, or to your VM or whatever you have. Um, then one separation that needed to be more expressed with Traffic V2 is the differentiation in, in config. As I said, we have dynamic configuration. Like we contact Kubernetes, we contact Docker Swarm, whatever part is handling your workloads, and we receive that configuration dynamically, like routers, services, middlewares. On the other hand, entry points and other information, like for example, credentials to connect to a Kubernetes API or whatever, these are defined in the, in the static configuration. And that could either be command line arguments or, or a TOML file or whatever you want to give it. But that's like not, not changing really often, because that's just the configuration it needs when it starts up, while the dynamic configuration is applied like on the fly uh, every time it receives a new one. So that's, that's an, important, an important difference to know. One cool thing is what we figured, and what was uh, like the first, the first uh, one of the first requests we had from our users, is to connect traffic with Let's Encrypt, so traffic can can uh, manage the Let's Encrypt certificates for you. Okay, last week was quite a bad week for like having a Let's Encrypt integration at hand, but it is what it is. Um, so. What it will do then is you configure, like you said, and you basically set a boolean, let's say, on a on a service, and then traffic will just like take over the Let's Encrypt management for this for this service you set, and it will store the it will store the certificate, it will renew the certificate, so you just don't so you just don't have to uh, you just have to worry anymore. So as I said, most people currently use, uh, use Kubernetes, and therefore an important part is traffic running with Kubernetes. What it does then usually is that it runs as an ingress controller. So it just looks for the, for the core ingress objects inside your Kubernetes cluster, which I think you are aware of. Then it checks for the, for the hosts, for example, that are set in that rule. And then it auto-configures itself automatically. 
However, uh, that's a bit hard to read. Um, so that's like the basic ingress. You give it an ingress class just to make sure that traffic is like um, the one that should work on it. And then there is just like a host with local host and maybe a path and which service, uh, which service to contact and, uh, and that's it. However, the ingress has some, um, has not just some, it has a lot of, um, lot of limitations in terms of, in terms of extensibility. What, um, what all of the, not just us, but also Nginx and all the others in this system done have done is that they allowed what, whoopala, that they allowed what we see here, the so-called annotations, which is basically a key value, a key value thing attached to an object. To, to configure this, this service, but just managing basically strings, because that's what it is, is, um, is a bit painful, not just for the users, but also for us as vendors having to maintain that mess. So with the, with the uh, latest releases of Kubernetes, and we heard about this today as well in the, in the operator talk, um, Kubernetes itself introduced the concept of CRDs, of custom resource definitions. And as we had problems working with the, with the plain ingress anymore, we decided to, to also offer a, a CRD called ingress route. And that one is just a bit easier to configure than working with the plain ingress. Because as you can see, all the fields like entry points and routes and stuff, uh, it's, just, it's, just, um, it's just more or less self-explanatory. So you give it a descriptive, a descriptive rule a descriptive match to an entry point and stuff, and it just goes from there without having to to um, uh, to, to look up crazy key value pairs. It's it's basically that. What we also have is, as I said, we now also are TCP compatible. So we not only have the ingress route for the HTTP part, but also for the for the uh, for the TCP part. And the cool thing about here is, as we can see, we uh, where is my mouse? It's gonna lost. Ah, here it is. Um, as we can see here, it's also it also works with host SNI. So if the underlying TCP protocol reuses TLS to like transfer some sort of uh, of host information, we can also do an SNI based based routing and therefore uh, yeah just load balance across the same part to different TCP applications as we could do with HTTP applications. And that's basically for the first part here. I would now go off to a quick demo to show you to actually uh, what, we, what we do. So my current example, or my current, we're like, where am I on? I'm currently running on a, is that readable in the back? Yeah, fine. Uh, just a three node Kubernetes cluster running on DigitalOcean, so nothing, nothing too crazy here. Um, where am I in the trash? <laughs> that that's a good question actually. Uh, slides Nemo blah, blah, blah. Nope, that's wrong. Dum, 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 dum. Okay, here I am correct. Um, so the first thing I will do is basically just a prepare step. So I could do this with Helm, uh, also with Helm v3, but um, yeah, it's lame to do it. Um, so what we what, what I first do is I will apply all the CRDs that we that we bring into play. Um, I will create a separate namespace just for traffic, and I will set up the needed service account. And in my demo case, just a cluster admin, but it could of course be stripped down to the actual uh, to the actual permissions. But as I'm just running on my cluster here, that doesn't really matter. So we quickly apply that. We see all the CRDs are created, the namespace is created, the service account is created. That was that was originally boring. Um, now the fun part. Um, usually we deploy traffic as um, just as a deployment. So the orchestrator in that case, Kubernetes, will take care of the scheduling. And what we see here is that, uh, as I said, we can provide um, static configuration just as a command line. Uh, just as a uh, command line example. So we will raise three entry points, web and web secure and traffic with the matching ports. Um, I will enable the, the dashboard. 
that's actually wrong because it's not an insecure, but whatever. Um, we will enable the dashboard. We will uh, enable what we call the provider to, to fetch the dynamic configuration. In my case here, it's the Kubernetes CRD provider. I configure something that we have, the certificate resolver. That's the one talking to Let's Encrypt in my example. And I tell them, well, please use the TLS challenge, link their certificates to this email address, and please store your, your uh, certificates received into that file. And that's actually the, it. The rest is just a couple of persistent volume claims and stuff to like keep the certificates, but that's not, it's not that much, um, not that much. So I will quickly apply that because afterwards it will take a minute for DigitalOcean. So we go for this. Um, in the meantime, what we have is um, uh, what, what we will do as I enabled the dashboard. I also expose the dashboard as, um, as a Kubernetes service going to the port. And then we define an ingress route. As I said, this is our part of, um, of um, of, of managing the HTTP requests. And I attach it to, for this case now, the web entry point because it's just, just HTTP. I want to have it accessible on the host uh, traffic.manualzap.io. And I want to have it linked to the traffic dashboard service so it knows where to go. And this one was applied automatically as well, as we can see. So this is like these two lines, there's the service traffic dashboard in the ingress route. So let's quickly head for the DigitalOcean control panel to see how fast how fast DigitalOcean wants to be today, or if it's like freaking slow. And there we can see the load balancer still needs submitted. So in the meantime, any questions? Because now we gotta wait. <laughs> no questions so far. That's easy. Ah, and there we go actually. So I will I will copy the uh, the IP address and just set two of my domains to that newly um, to that newly IP save and save. So if I didn't do something wrong, when I now go for traffic.manualzapf.io, we hopefully see the dashboard if the demo gods are with me, and they are. So here we go. That's the dashboard of traffic v2.1 so far. Um, as we can see, we have the entry points in the upper part, so which ports I open. Then we have an overview about the dynamic configuration it received from, in my case, from the Kubernetes. So we can see it picked up a couple of HTTP configuration for routers, services, and middlewares. For TCP, none so far, because we didn't deploy any, any ingress route TCP objects. Then just an overview about, uh, let's say, global features like tracing and metrics and stuff, whether they are disabled, uh, enabled or not, and which providers are enabled. Once we go, for example, for the routers, we see that there are currently uh, three routers, uh, three routers um, created automatically. So we could we have my 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 self-made traffic um, traffic uh, configuration which I showed you, but also traffic this um, basically exposes this as a configuration by its own. So if you're not in the insecure mode, you could just like pick it up and do whatever you want. Um, from the router, we see the overview. So it's currently attached to the entry point 80. That's my current router. It has this rule. Here it is. And it's green, so all good. And from there, it goes to the service object. And the service doesn't have anything special. It's used by this router. It get one backend container. So as boring as it can guess, uh, as it can get. The next cool thing is because just having a um, just having um, a dashboard is a bit a bit boring. We will deploy a simple web application, so it's just a namespace. It's a simple deployment for um, for for my demo application. It's our Who Am I image. Some of you might know it. And then there is again an ingress route. So I attach it to the web entry point, and I uh, attach this ingress route to the service web app v1 with the host web app.manualshub.io and that's that's basically it. So if I apply this, we will see that he configured it. So going back to here, to my dashboard, we now see four 
routers instead of three. Here is it, host web app.minorsf.io. So if I open that one, we see the service answering. It's the UMI service. So as I said, nothing, nothing too special. Uh, just basically it prints all the headers. So you have a debug point in case you are debugging in your ingress world. So that was easy. That was cool. But I said that we also have Canary. So let's do a quick Canary example. What we need for Canary? Well, we need a second service. So we deploy a second service by the name uh, WebAppv2. We also create a Kubernetes service object. That's it. And then comes the fun part. What we now create is another, another CRD that we bring. That CRD is called Traffic Service. We give it a name. In my example, Web App Canary. And then we give it, uh, we, we said that it's a weighted, a weighted service. And we link it to the both services we currently have deployed. So we say, OK, Web App V1 has a weight of three. So it should receive three requests. Web App V2. It has a weight of one, so it should be three for v1, one for v2. And as we didn't, um, and now we need to like overwrite our existing ingress route because now it's not going to the web app service anymore, but instead to the web app canary service anymore, which we which we set here. And we say, okay, it's not a basic Kubernetes service, but instead a traffic service. So quickly applying this one. Uh, wrong name, because I'm stupid. There we go. So if we then go back to the dashboard, we will see that change. So on the routers, it's the same, because it's still, it's still the web app. But the service, the service changed, because now it's the web app canary. So if we go for the web app canary, we see that this has the two configured services we have. So web app v1, web app v2, with the rate 3 and 1. So that being said, if I refresh here like three times, and the, first, uh, the fourth, it will go to some other service. So one, two, three. Ah, well, there was one. There. OK. It was one more, but whatever. So it switched to, to Nginx. And now refreshing again, we are here again. So it, swift, it uh, shifts the traffic given the configuration. And that's an easy, that's an easy uh, canary, an, an easy canary setup. Last but not least, because I, I uh, briefly touched it, is that we can do uh, TLS and let's encrypt. So I want to do this as well. What I also want to do, because it's basically something you will, uh, you will, you will encounter quite early. I also define a middleware, and I call the middleware redirect HTTP, because we have a middleware which is called redirect scheme, which I can use to redirect to HTTPS. So I configure this one and say, OK, please redirect to HTTPS. So that's a middleware object. As we've learned, it edits either the request or the response. Then in the existing ingress route, we go back to just the web app v1, because why not? But what changed is we now attach it a middleware. In my example, we attach it the middleware redirect HTTP. So every request coming for webapp.manualsoft.io attached to the web entry point, port 80, will, will end up eventually in this defined middleware, which will redirect me to HTTPS. And as we now need an HTTPS, we define a second ingress route, which we call Web App TLS. We will attach this only to the, to the Web Secure entry point. It has the same rule, the same service. It's all the same. The only thing that is changed here is that we give it a specific TLS, um, a specific TLS section containing the certificate resolver. And as we have seen in the static configuration, we give it the certificate resolver I called default. And that's just going for for uh, yeah, for plain let's encrypt. So let's quickly let's quickly apply that. From what I know, that will now take a couple of seconds, uh, maybe twenty to thirty seconds. So let's see. To see the progress, I will get the tra the pods in the traffic namespace. So that's it. And then kubectl logs minus n traffic. As we deployed it with log level debug, we will see some stuff. And as we can see here, it already starts to go for Acme. So 
it builds the client, it connects with Let's Encrypt, it, it starts to register a Let's Encrypt client, and here he is trying to solve the TLS challenge because we set it to TLS, and I will make follow logs, otherwise that's going to be a little hard. Then we see that the TLS challenge is present, so he presents the temporary TLS certificate, that's good. So within like the next couple of seconds, it should be fine. Here we go. So we have seen that here we see server responded with a certificate, certificates obtained for domains, blah, so that's good. Adding certificate for domain, so that's, that's all done. He received the Let's Encrypt certificate. So going back to the web app and just reloading the page, redirects me to HTTPS as we have seen, and there is the lock. So it is an HTTPS connection, opening the certificate. That's the Let's Encrypt certificate. All done, case closed. That was pretty cool. All right, that's for the ingress part. Um, what, uh, what we also have, which is like the next step, let's say, what ingress is, is north south, because it takes a request inside your cluster and gives it through. What we also have now, as we also need to want to take care of the east-west, like service-to-service -service communication, is a lightweight approach of mesh, which is our simpler service mesh solution. Um, most of the Kubernetes users, I mean, it's already wrong that they use Kubernetes because I said 95% of the people probably don't need it, but somehow they end up in, okay, I need a service mesh as well. And we tackle service meshes a bit different because mesh is a lightweight and easy to configure service mesh. So it's definitely not as invasive as, for example, the big beast Istio. What we do different is that is the normal a normal architecture, like you have your ingress controller and that example traffic, and it routes the request to pod B because that's like the matching service, and then pod B wants to contact pod D so it goes straight. What we do instead of, for example, Linkerd or Istio, we don't go for the sidecar proxy, so not every, every pod we deploy has its own pod, but instead we deploy as a daemon set, so we only have one proxy per node, taking in the connections and then going to the actual destination. The cool thing about this is, is, uh, is as of this, it's super lightweight and non-invasive, so we don't rewrite, we don't write IP tables or all of that stuff. How it works is we, um, we basically set an own zone, so if you, if you instead talk to your service by its normal service name, if you then contact it by uh, service name dot service namespace dot mesh, you basically opt in into the usage of the service mesh because you changed, you changed your endpoint and then your request will, will flow through the mesh. The cool thing about this is it's built, it's built on top of traffic because, I mean, we have the technology already, so why not reuse it? It's SMI, this stands for Service Mesh Interface Specification Compliant. So a couple months ago, basically, um, they basically decided that service meshes need some sort of specification so that you can easily switch between the service meshes that, that you can choose from the CNCF landscape because there are already, uh, you saw the landscape in Marco's talk, it's a mess, but there are also service meshes in. Um, so it's compliant to this. So what you can do is first install mesh. It's just the Helm chart, basically. So just Helm repo add, Helm repo update, Helm install, you're good. And then you can use, for the people that might know it, you can just use the SMI objects that these SMI specification features, and then you will have the functionality. No, uh, that's basically all. Um, two last words. Here are stickers for the people that did not have stickers yet. And we are also hiring. So if you're looking for engineering and go talk to me, that's it. Thanks. Happy to solve your questions. <laughs> questions? <laughs> yeah, and if you go for the QR code, you can see the slides online. Those, those middlewares, are they in process or are they extra services? So I didn't understand, the sorry. Middlewares, yeah? are, the, are they in process or are they extra services? No, they are in process. Okay. 
So is there a community of new middlewares or just the ones you write? Uh, we currently have around 18, if I remember correctly, that you can just choose from. But um, let, let's, see, let's say we are figuring out a process how the community could have its own middlewares instead of contributing them to the to the um, to, to just to the GitHub repository. More questions? Thanks. <laughs> no, 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 stop. Oh, I gotta go. See ya. <laughs> why you choose this way out of process? It's easier for you, or why all other service mesh making in place? You mean for the for, for the pods? Patterns. Yeah. Why you choose this way? We what what we wanted to do first is, as I said, we wanted to have a lightweight alternative because the others are just like super messy and super super huge, and they especially Istio offers a lot of features that like 99% of its users probably doesn't need because it's just so feature blown. So we wanted to go back to um, to 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 feature foundation, let's say to like maybe cover 80% of the features the others do, but if these are the features that, um, that, that like most of the people need, it's fine, then we can live with it. And for features like circuit breakers, retries, stuff like that, you don't need like a pot per uh, a sidecar proxy pot per, per pot, because there's just no need. For that reason, we currently don't have, or we not have MTLS yet, because for that you would need like the proxy. But we waited, especially for which is now released, Kubernetes 1.17, because you can set a service topology inside Kubernetes then, so you can instruct your pods to talk to other pods, which when they are only on the same machine as the pod currently talking. So then again, just having a proxy, a proxy pod per node is completely fine, because you can have the MTLS from there, because Connection between nodes should probably be encrypted, but if you're screwed by someone listening on the traffic on your node already, no encryption will save you. You're screwed then anyways. So sure. that's why we went for this simpler approach. Nope. nope. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. I'm here all day long if you have questions.